made this for you! Before I start this video, I want to take a second to recommend the movie Take Every Wave, The Life of Laird Hamilton. Fair warning, it's a very raw film, and there is some stuff in there that some viewers may find hard to watch. But you don't need to understand surfing at all to understand the moral and the message behind the whole thing. It's a powerful story about resilience and dedication, and if you need some kind of motivation to do something, you might just find it there. I've talked about a lot of games, I've played a lot of games, and by this point I thought I wouldn't find anything that could still surprise me, but I don't think anything I've ever played could have prepared me for this. Today, we're we're gonna take a look at Airblade for the PS2. Thank you to everybody who suggested this. I got the first suggestions a long time ago, and I kept meaning to mix it in with the regular crowd of games, but whether it was back then or right now doesn't really matter. We got here eventually. Let's get started. Airblade, developed by Criterion and published by Namco in 2002, is a tech fantasy hoverboard action adventure game. If that statement was a little bit confusing, don't worry, I'm just as confused as you are. I'm pretty familiar with board sports. I know a good amount about skateboarding and snowboarding and a little bit about surfing, but hoverboards are not my territory. Back when this game came out, hoverboards weren't actually a thing that existed, but these days there are actually real hoverboards, and they're nothing like science fiction thought they would be. If you've never seen it before, the Lexus Slide was a real hoverboard that used maglev technology to sustain itself above the ground. Half of the technology was the park itself. Crazy as it is, we live in a world where we have actual fucking levitation. Isn't that amazing? Back on topic, the lead programmer for this game actually had a whole team full of people who previously had experience with exactly this kind of game. Quite a few of the programmers previously worked on the game Trick Style in 1999. There's also a massive chunk that worked on the original Burnout trilogy. This kind of record always makes me feel a little bit better before going into something. The story here is kind of crazy. You play as a guy who lives in an apartment with this other guy and this girl. I didn't really take the time to learn their names, so we'll just call them Thing 1 and Thing 2. Apparently, Thing 1 stole a hoverboard from some mobsters, so they show up and kick his ass to take it back. Thing 2 tells us to go get it and don't let the bad dudes get a hold of it. The player character then takes this package, opens it, learns that it's a hoverboard, and for some reason everybody decides that it's just absolutely necessary to put everybody in danger over this thing. So we keep it. I don't know what the hell is happening honestly, this is like a fever dream. I really would love to have a conversation with the beautiful mind that wrote the story because there's a level of creativity here far beyond that of most other games. For starters, why the fuck do these mobsters want this hoverboard so badly? What kind of world is this where a mobster wants a hoverboard so much that he's willing to beat up and kidnap a bunch of 90s college kids? Also, why are the rebellious heroes a bunch of 90s college kids? Before I move on to the gameplay, I'm gonna be 100% real and tell you that I didn't finish the game. I actually am very curious about the story, I have many questions. But there are some things about this game that really turn me off. Let's talk about the gameplay. As far as the controls go, it's a pretty standard tech fantasy scheme. You've got a jump, a variety of tricks, a car grind, a combo meter, and for some reason a nitro button. Unlike most other tech fantasy games, all of this score and other stuff doesn't really matter much, if at all. This game is very linear, unfortunately. Goals can be done in any order that you want, almost, within the time limit, but if you fail to do every goal within that time limit, you completely fail the level and have to start over from the beginning. The goals themselves are very repetitive in nature, more so than most other games like this. The majority of them are smack this bad guy, swing on this pole, and smash through this thing. So what we have here is essentially an adventure platformer beat-em-up that you play on a hoverboard. So it's a tech fantasy platformer adventure beat-em-up hoverboard game. Are you lost yet? Yeah, me too. The controls aren't bad. The mapping is very standard. There's a good variety of tricks, and you can do a lot of tricks on the flat because you don't have those pesky wheels to slow you down. But perhaps the most interesting thing about this is the pole swinging mechanic. Because of the heavy platformer elements, this actually makes a hell of a lot more sense here than it did an aggressive inline. Like, I really like it in that game, it adds a lot to it, but here it thematically fits in a little bit better. It also feels okay to use. My one major gripe with this game's controls is the turning. It's very floaty, and that's not just because you're riding a hoverboard. That's a pretty dumb excuse for bad controls. Turning is extremely sharp and sensitive, so navigation isn't nearly as comfortable as your standard board sports games usually are. It actually gets to feeling very uncomfortable after not a very long amount of time. I don't get as easily frustrated as I used to when I was young, but I am still a person. I still get easily frustrated. And something about the turning in this game frustrates the hell out of me. When you mix that in with the speed, it gets a little bit worse. And there's also the matter of the braking, which is so sudden that it doesn't feel comfortable along with that. The movement, the thing that the entire game is built around and relies on, is not made very well. Another thing that really frustrates me here is the name of every trick. I watched the 
making of Airblade video in the options menu, and in that we learn that the studio actually used real-world skaters for the game's motion capture. So why, if I may ask, is every single trick named something stupid or wrong? 360 shove it. No, no, surely you must mean 360 kick it. Sack tap. No, no, that's called a rocket. Kick flip. No, that's an air walk. That, that's what you mean, actually. The funniest thing about this is that the impossible is still just called the impossible. So this isn't a situation where they didn't know the tricks or didn't have a means to learn the names. They just intentionally changed what all of them were called to make the hoverboard look like its own independent thing. The behind the scenes bonus film was actually a great insight into a lot of the thoughts that went into making this game, but unfortunately, the actual intentions make a lot of the decisions much worse. Visually, this game looks like garbage. The team had some of the worst graphics ideologies I've ever seen in a PS2 title. The original concepts for the character art that gets shown off in the behind the scenes film are badass, and more grounded in the fantasy feeling of the whole thing. But apparently when Namco got involved, suddenly the idea of a fantasy game was completely thrown out the window. <laughs> the new goal was make it realistic, and seriously, whoever made that decision should have been fired. It isn't just me, right? It's pretty obvious why that didn't work. Criterion tried to make their science fiction fantasy hoverboard action game into a realistic action sports title. The character designs all suffer tremendously for it, but they aren't even the worst part. The absolute worst part of the visuals is the level design. It's dismal, gray, boring, and horrible to look at. Something that makes it worse is that the actual map layouts are headache inducing. So many objects are put in some horrible spot, and a huge bulk of the goal will have you moving from the ground to the rooftops at random. The whole point was to put a great emphasis on the pole swinging mechanics, but that often hurts a lot more than it helps. Many of the rooftops are unguarded and thin, so it's very easy to fall and lose a lot of time. Worse than that, many of the rooftop entrances are so narrow that you're almost guaranteed to fall off at least once. It's really not a comfortable game to play. The design is bad. If the controls were less floaty, or if the levels were much bigger, it would be better. But because of the way it is, it's pretty bad. The soundtrack and the sound design is, at least, okay. In previous videos, I've referred to a specific kind of music that I like to call generic racing music. That's this game's entire soundtrack. I can't even really describe it. The best way to get an idea of what I mean when I say generic racing music is just to listen to this soundtrack once. You could play it over cruising, or being an adventure racing, or one of the Sega arcade racing games, and it's pretty much all the same thing. That doesn't really mean the music is bad, it's just very generic. Something that is is bad is the voice acting, and it isn't good bad in the Resident Evil kind of way. It's bad bad in the this is just done poorly and not that great kind of way. Jackass, I just phoned the cops. Honey, I own the cops. Get her, boys. Yeah, boy. Get her! Just get away. Oh, you shouldn't have. What the? Oh. Oh. Yes. The sound effects are fine, at least. You know, that's something. Finally, there is no real-world hoverboard footage because hoverboards literally did not exist when this game came out. But if you watch the making of movie, there is actually some behind-the-scenes real-world skateboarding footage in there because of the mocap stuff. The problem with including behind-the-scenes things in your games is that you explain a lot of the thought process that goes into them. And a big part of appreciating something that is done bad is not knowing what the actual thought process was. So like, knowing that some of the bad decisions were made intentionally really hurts the game a lot more than it helps in this instance. Like, if the visual and gameplay mistakes were constraints of the project itself and the deadline and the budget, then that would have been a lot more understandable. But the keyword realism popping up all over the place and the weird decisions on every front to make this some kind of tied into reality thing, that all really served to be a detriment to the game in the long run. This was the age of renderware, and Criterion was using renderware. If they stopped and looked at any other game that was made with the exact same engine, they would have discovered very quickly that making a realistic game wasn't exactly its strong suit. Renderware was used the best when the designers focused on a style that fit within the limitations of the engine. Games that were actually based on real sports usually didn't try to opt for this kind of realism approach, and many of them were wildly successful. There was no reason to opt for it here, and it really did hurt the game. Instead of playing this, your time was definitely better spent out enjoying the real world or playing pretty much any other game that isn't this. With all that out of the way, I'll go ahead and give Airblade for the PS2 a rating of 5 
out of 10. This game isn't good, but it also isn't bad, and it's also kind of good sometimes. The gameplay itself really isn't the worst part of the whole thing. It is functional. There is a functional and playable game here, and there aren't that many bugs. But every single other design decision serves to just be a hindrance. I've given games bad reviews before, like BMX Triple X or Skateboard Madness, but if I can be completely real for a second, I would rather give a game a bad review than an average one. A 5 out of 10 is aggressively average and that's my least favorite kind of game to talk about. Extremely bad games are at least memorable, and the time spent going through them solely for the experience is worth it to some degree. Sort of like the movie The Room by Tommy Wiseau. I won't remember much about this game, but I do remember games that are much worse than this. This has no memorable moments or characters. There's no new memorable addition to the gameplay formula. There's practically no difficulty aside from the jankiness of it all, and I'm sick of staring at the color gray. The only thing I'll remember about this game in one year is that it was a boring hoverboard game that I spent a little bit of time with. And that's a tragedy. That being said, I am at least glad that I played it so I could cross it off of the list. I'm also glad that it gave me an opportunity to talk a little bit about the thought process I go through when I rate a game. But this is a huge pass for me, dog. If it looks like it's for you, then go ahead and give it a shot. It's not terrible, it's just definitely not for me. Now that I'm done with all that, you probably already know what's next. It's finally time to take on the Goliath that is Tony Hawk Ride and Shred. I don't want to say anything yet. I'll talk about everything during the video. If you've been here since Pro Skater 5, then you've probably been waiting for this for a while. But if you haven't seen my Pro Skater 5 review, then it's worth going back and watching that, as well as the HD 2012 review before I release Ride and Shred. They're contextually very important for what I have to say. Until then, thank you, and have a nice day.